this is the Provoke Prawn, and in this video, I'm going to be talking to you about how to set up and install the Lee and Lee Landcall 3. And I actually purchased this case specifically because I wanted to use a 420mm all in one cooler for this build. And I wanted to show off how to do that because this case is capable of taking it. And it is also interesting for a number of other reasons. And it's very modular and it's also able to pack in a ridiculous amount of drives and other things into it. So I'm going to show you the various steps that I went through in order to get the end result that you saw just a second ago. And in the future, I'm going to be revisiting this case, swapping out all the fans in it for some more RGB ones. And I want to talk about a few things as I go through here, including the different highlights of it. So as you can see, it comes pre-installed with three RGB fans in the front and a single non-RGB fan on the rear. But the end set up here, and I'll link all those specs in the description, includes a 420mm Corsair cooler and three fans on that, obviously. So I ended up with six fans total by the end of this video. And I'm going to show you a number of different things that I went through here, including some frustrations with the setup. But generally speaking, another fantastic Lee and Lee case, well thought out, interestingly engineered and intriguing. Like, I don't understand why they put a glass panel on the side where all the cables are. And that's a weird one. But it does give you a lot of flexibility in terms of the modularity of a thing. And there's a lot of hidden highlights in here as well that you might be aware of if you're looking into it. But for example, you can reposition the front fans to put them closer to your motherboard, which is intriguing. Now it has obviously RGB lighting built into those as well. And there's a button on the top to switch between those RGB lighting modes alongside the power and reset button two USB-A and a USB-C connections. And we'll show you the setup for all that later on. And as usual, lots of removable panels with nice dust filtering on them. This is not a review, but I am going to talk about the features of it and the highlights of what I thought of it. I'm going to do a review later on once I've actually done two builds in it, because I want to show separate setups for that and talk about my experiences there. But you can see from multiple different angles the sort of interesting hinges on it. So you can see that you have to pull the front sort of flaps to access the door to open the door up. And then those glass doors are then removable, which is obviously excellent for the build process because it means you can get them out of the way and not risk damaging them. It also gives you some flexibility in sort of moving around the case and just moving it back and forth and getting access to all the different things. The rear side also has multiple panels on it and they're also removable, you'll see in a second. And you can pull the front off. Although I will note that I found that hard to get back on. More on that later on, because some of the clips on that are a bit flimsy. And I actually think that's the one bit that lets this case down is the design of this front. It's not that easy to get on and off, which could be problematic when it comes to cleaning the front intakes. But that's a small point. The case itself is also big enough to be able to house larger motherboards and has some modularity and adjustment in some clever things like the cable hiding tray. It's also designed to work with custom liquid cord system as well, so full liquid loop systems you can fit in here. And you have multiple mounting point logic for radiators. And the most intriguing thing about it for me is that it's a mid-tower setup and yet you can fit a 420 mil radiator at the top of it. And that's the reason I purchased it because I wanted to demonstrate that and show the setup process for the Corsair H170i Elite Capelix XT, which I've done a video on separately. But there are a number of other things in here, one of which is the sheer amount of SSD and hard disk drive mounting points that I'll get to in a minute. It also, as I said, has one rear fan that doesn't have RGB on it, which is weird. I think I hate it when manufacturers include three RGB fans and then one that isn't, because that, then what are you going to do with that? Most people will probably end up getting rid of it in favor of an RGB fan, but more on that later on. You also see these flip down panels at the back and front that flip down and then give you access to the underside. These are interesting because you'll see that they have venting on them, but there's also mounting points for SSDs on there as well. So more on that in a bit. But if I open up the case with these various panels at the rear, which again are removable, as I showed, you can see there are five SSD points that you can mount on just at a glance. There's actually a lot more than that, which is insane. So if you're really into 2.5 inch SSDs or 3.5 inch hard disk drives, there's absolutely loads of points in here for that. So if you really want loads 
of affordable storage rammed into this case, then you're going to be happy because you can see just this panel here alone can hold three, for example. And I'll show you the setup process for that in a minute. But then you have the hard drive cages, you have these two SSD points mounted here, and then you have other things. So there's a removable backplate that goes behind the motherboard, for example. You have various different mounting points for control boxes, for fans. This could go on or it can go on the side. So if you're using the IAM or Commander Core or XT, for example, in this build, or if you're using Lian Lee fans, so you want to use their control box, then you can mount it there. And lots of space down the bottom as well, which I was surprised by, but the hard disk drive is also removable. So I'll show you the tray removal there. But all the usual sort of dust panels as well. So plenty of good cooling areas where the air can blow through, but also plenty of good blockage to stop the dust getting into the case as well. Now for the purposes of this build, I actually need to remove this rear fan anyway. So despite my complaints about it, I'm actually gonna take it out. To install a 420 mil radiator, you need to get rid of this fan, get it out of the way so you actually have the space to put the radiator in. So you can take that out. It is nice to have this many fans included in a case for sure. And this is one of the reasons why I'm doing a pretty basic build in here, because I'm just sticking with the standard included fans and then just using the radiator and seeing how it holds up in terms of the performance with just that without going crazy and installing loads of other fans. Also, it has an interesting setup, so I wanna revisit this on the bottom, just below the bar the board, which I'll show in a second, where you could potentially mount fans or a radiator, but you can also put SSDs. You actually have a lot of modular sort of logic to this case, and that always seems to be the way with Lee and Lee's cases, and that's certainly a good highlight to them in my mind. Now, one of the things that I talked about earlier is that you have the ability to move the cable tray so here there's some thumb screws at the rear, which you can undo and then you can just slide that tray out of the way and adjust the position of where it sits. This is obviously useful if you want to go for an EATX motherboard, so if you're using a larger motherboard, but it also gives some flexibility just for installing things. So you can just move it out of the way, go about installing things and then push it back in when you need to. And I found this particularly useful, but it just gives you that little bit of extra space and adjustability as well if you have trouble with mounting the power supply cables. A bit more on that later as well. There's also a number of cable ties in here and they are sort of long cable ties, the logic of which is basically doubled over. So what you can do is you can run cables behind the cable ties, so right behind the two layers and then in front of it as well. So you can actually tie them up in two different positions, which is pretty neat. Obviously you also have the cables pre-installed so the fans that come on the front both the rgb and fan power for them are actually connected up already and then you just have a single connector that you need to plug in and i'll show you that later on and then you have obviously the front panel connections which i'll also get to i'm going to cover everything that you'd need to do in this build so it's really straightforward if you're looking to build if you're a beginner so it'll make life a little bit easier. And I'm gonna try and show some of the logic of it, although obviously I'm not mounting all the potential SSDs and hard disk drives that you could in there, but I will show you some of the spots. The other thing, as I said, is that this front panel for the fans is removable, but it's also repositionable. So you can actually adjust it through various different positions to get it closer to the motherboard tray. I didn't do it, but you can, and it shows you in the manual how to, so basically you just take it out and then you just slightly adjust it further back into the case so you can recess it in, which then gives you better airflow potentially, which is pretty interesting. Also nice RGB fans are standard. You saw some of the RGB lighting in the beginning and you have a controllable button on the top where you can just press. But if you're using Lee and Lee fans in it as well throughout the case and you happen to have a controller, you can potentially plug those fans into there. So one of the other really interesting things immediately is actually the SSD mounting. So it's a basic level of the easiest possible SSD mounting in here. There's these two trays at the back and these mount simply by pushing into the clips. So you've got four holes on either side of the SSD normally and the clips in this tray mount up, just line up with those points. So you can see just push one side of the tray out and then essentially those little points on either side of the SSD just push into the holes on there and then it just holds it in place. So you can mount two in here like that within a flash. So in a blink of an eye, they're already installed. Now this is just two points. You actually have multiple other positions that you can mount SSDs in. And I'll get to those in a second. 
But I think that sort of speaks to the quality of the case, the ease of which you can build in here and just the flexibility of it. There's an included box which has extra trays in it as well. So there's more in there. And then you have a little box here, which is jam packed full of screws for all the different mounting points and other things that you can do. And one of the things that's interesting about this box I'll show you in a second is that you can also section it off with included plastic bits and then you can basically put these screws in the right places so you can stick them in different holes so you can keep track of what's what. Because actually when I first got it out of the box, as you'll see in a second, it's kind of frustrating because what they've done is they've included basically the SSD screws and all the other screws, hard disk drive screws, SSD screws, fan screws and things like that are all bundled together in a couple of bags and you have to sort them out yourself first, which is a bit of a faff, but then you have this little box. So once you have sorted them out, you can put them in the box in the various different trays and position them so that they're ready for the build process, which is pretty neat. You also then have this mounting bracket, which is essentially an ANSI SAG bracket for your GPU. I didn't end up using that because I'm gonna be changing the GPU setup, but you can mount this in there. There's instructions on how to do that. And that will essentially then hold your GPU in place so it will prevent sag over time so it doesn't bend down on one side which is pretty nice it's a nice little touch there now you have a number of these rubber grommets which basically washers that sit on the back of either hard disk drive or SSD and keep them anti-vibration mounts essentially and so you position those in the right places to stop your drive noise from going through into the case and there are a lot of them as you can see so multiple different drives can be installed and then you've got the two bags and you have to sort through. Now, as you can see on the right hand side, you have a hardware list of what screws fit where. And so you obviously have motherboard screws. You've got SSD screws. You've got hard disk drive screws. You've got fan screws. I had to spend quite a bit of time sorting these out into the right order because the two bags aren't labeled of what's what. So you've got to try and work out which one's which. And that was the biggest frustration of the entire thing. But once you've done it, you can then put these little dividers into the plastic case and then you can put the screws in there. So I'd recommend spending a little bit of time doing this, just looking at that hardware list and then working out what screws do what and then putting them in the box so that you don't end up messing them up, mixing them up and getting confused as to what because the SSD and hard disk drive screws, for example, are very similar just ever so slightly different. So now I'm going to show you the process for mounting the SSD. You basically put the little rubber washers in place over the holes and then you find the SSD screws that are included in there and you screw it through into that. And this then essentially acts as little hooks that will then hook into various points in the case and I'll show you the places that you can mount it on. There are some where you might need to screw the screws through the case and then into the SSD but I'll talk about that in a second. But you can see the setup process for this is fairly straightforward. If you only have a couple of these, it's going to be really easy. I'm only using one for demonstration purposes, but I will show you where it can potentially mount as we're going through. So here's one of the fold out trays. So this is the tray that I showed you that folds down from the bottom of the case. And what you do if you're mounting one of the SSDs on there is you basically just slip it and push it. So it just sits in those notches and then you slide it obviously onto the case and tuck it away out of sight. You obviously have to plug the cables in, connect up to the motherboard and power supply unit. I'll show you that in a second. But you can see just how easy that would be. So you could potentially put three there and you could put three on the back of the case. The other thing of interest here is that at the front at the bottom, you've got three more points for mounting SSDs. Now this is slightly different because you need to screw these in from below, but the tray is removable. So you could take it off and you could screw the SSDs onto it, put them there, then run the cables through to the back and then underneath and round to the rear and neaten things up there. So you can already see absolutely loads of SSD mounting points in here. I'll leave all the specs of the case in the description so you can find out more about it and what you can do. And I'd recommend checking out Leon Lee's page on this, the official page to see all the different sort of specs of it as well. The hard disk drive trays are also removable. And what I noticed is that there's some clips on the bottom of them that are ever so slightly different on one to the other, which is worth bearing in mind because there's basically runs at the bottom of the case that you can see where the bits sit into and then run along. So you can actually reposition them and slide them about and you can take them out. So if you're not going to be using hard disk drives or you don't need extra points for mounting SSDs, you may want to remove these because this may help with airflow because obviously the air would flow better underneath the bottom of the case if they weren't there through to the power supply unit and also potentially up from the bottom because obviously you can see that front bottom fan 
is sort of along there. But you can see the difference between the underside here. You can see that the screws are mounted in different places, so you can't actually put these the wrong way around when you're putting them back in. Although you could theoretically take those screws out and adjust it. But here you can see just how those two are set up differently. However, the mounting logic is fairly similar to what we just did with the SSDs. So you have different screws, but you use the same rubber washers. So they sit over the various different points. There's four points on the hard disk drives and on the SSDs, same sort of logic. Uh, the washers go on there, then the screws go into those holes, and then basically it's clipped into the relevant mounting point. You have less places for mounting in a hard disk drive, but to be honest, most people probably nowadays are using NVMe SSDs, 2.5 inch SSDs, because they're faster than the old classic platter hard drives. There's a lot to be said for the storage size that you can get on a platter drive. I've got a few six terabyte drives that you can get, for example quite a lot of storage space but what you basically need to do is the same sort of logic of just screwing in these screws and then reading it to sit into the bays so there's plenty of screws included and plenty of washers too and once you've done that then you're then ready to set it up so you obviously have the removable trays that you can take out and they have a little screw that then holds that bracket in place so you can see there's a thumb screw at the bottom here we just undo that and then you can slide the bracket out where the drive would sit this will take both ssds and hard disk drives so you have the option of whether you mount one or the other in here or potentially both although i do think it'll be a bit tight it is possible to do so again it's the same sort of logic you're just pushing it in and sliding it along to lock it into place where those holes get smaller so you can see just how that works and then you need to, need to work out which way around the cables would be positioned because obviously you've got to put cables through for the data connection to your motherboard and power supply cable, the SATA connection, which I'll show you a bit later as well. Then you re-secure it with a thumb screw and then you put it back in the case and set it up there. In theory, you don't even need to take it out of the case. You could just unscrew that little thumb screw and pull the handle to pull it out. So you do have that option. I did find that one of them was a little bit tight, so I had to use a screwdriver to do it, but you can basically take that out and then slide it out. And again, same logic with the SSD. You can see that the SSD also takes up less room, but it fits in the same way. So the same thing that we did to install it somewhere else in the case, whether it's on those flaps, for example, you're basically just putting it in, pushing it down, and then it's secured. You don't need to screw it through the other side, but you could theoretically tighten it up a bit more maybe once it's in like this. And then you just put it back in this tray and then put the tray back in the case. Nice and straightforward. The idea here is that you have loads of different mounting points potentially though. So you get to choose where you're going to put these, how many you're going to put in. And I'd recommend considering this as well based on sort of the cabling logic. And I'll show you more about what I meant later on. But I do find that you do need to be neater in this case with your cable tidying than I've done in other recent cases because otherwise you might have trouble closing the door. So it's really important to bear that in mind now. Use cable ties whenever possible. Make the most of those Velcro ties, but also just think about how many cables you're going to have in here because it could potentially cause problems. So that is all the different sort of SSD and hard disk drive points that you have. You can see loads of those. So now I'm going to talk about power supply unit. This is an NZXT 1200 watt power supply unit. I've done a video separately on this, but I'm going to quickly talk through all the different PSU setup cables. It's the same logic for most modular power supply cables. And basically you only need to plug in what we're going to be using. So we're going to start with the 24 pin power supply cable. So this is the large fat one that you can see here. One end is split into two. We connect that up on the top left here to motherboard 20 pin and then the four pin connection. So those two cables set up and connected there. This is essential for powering the motherboard and it needs to be plugged in. I'm going to show you how to plug it in now just to show you the steps of how to do it outside of the case to make it a little bit easier for you to see. But obviously you'd actually do this once everything's finished. But you can see that it connects up on the right hand side. There's a clip that holds it in place. You need to push it in quite hard, but also carefully until there's a click. So that's then held down because that will make sure that that's secured and your motherboard won't boot properly, won't turn on properly if this power cable is not in place. Next one is the eight pin CPU power connectors. These plug in in the top right hand side of the power supply unit and basically you'd run those to the top of the motherboard. Now on this motherboard there's two 8 pin connectors so I actually need two of these. It may vary 
I've done the NZXT motherboard recently, which needed one eight pin and one four pin, so you could split those two in half. And sometimes I've seen three power connectors, but you can see a look at this motherboard is at the top left here, so you plug those in. Again, it's got clips on it, so you need to make sure that you push it until it clicks, and so they're fully secured. And once again, I'm showing you this now outside the case just so it's easier to see, but you'd actually do it later on once the motherboard's mounted. But what I want to also emphasize is that it's really important to make sure you know what cables you're connecting up to the power supply before you install it in the case, because it'll make life a lot easier. This is the SATA power connector. This is a flat power connector. This plugs into the peripheral and SATA connections on the power supply unit. This then gives you the power that you'd need for your SSDs, hard disk drives, fan controllers, RGB controllers and more and you can see that it has multiple different connections on it so you can actually connect up multiple different devices. I would suggest considering what you're connecting up though because if you are connecting up multiple fan controllers that might be problematic so you might want to install more than one of these cables but you can see the connection for an SSD and a hard disk drive is really simple it basically just slips in there and that's the power connection sorted and then you just need the data connection, which is a slightly different cable that I'll show you in a minute. Then the graphics card. So I actually gonna show you the connection for two different GPUs here, because this power supply unit also supports a 600 watt cable for the new 40 series GPUs. But in this instance, we're using the standard classic PCIe connection for a 30 series GPU. So this goes in the PCIe connection and then it has this sort of pigtail effect on the end where you've got two cables in one. So it's two eight pin connections. And then I have a Gigabyte 3090 GPU, which basically the cable plugs in on the other end of. Again, we do this when the GPU is mounted, but I want to show you the process for it in case you're not aware. So basically those two cables connect up to that. Now you might get better performance out of it if you use two separate single cables because you can get that with some power supply units where you have two cables without this sort of split between them and you can just basically plug one cable into one of these ports and the other cable into the other and then separate them out on the power supply end so that you have make sure you've got enough power. Pinch these two cables together and push them in because they are split. Sometimes you might find you have three connections. Some GPUs, it might just be a single connection. So you're gonna have to think about what, what cables you need before you build, because what you wanna do is make sure you've got the right amount of cables plugged in. Now for the newer 40 series, you've got the 600 watt power connector with this power supply unit, or you might have an adapter. You plug in one end into your power supply unit and then the other end into your GPU. For this instance, I'm using a Zotac 4080 graphics card. It has a slightly different connection, but it's only one cable, so it makes life a lot easier. You can see a close-up look of it here, and basically the cable just slips into that, but you will notice that there are some extra pins in there. You also need to take great care to ensure this is really carefully seated in there and pushed all the way in. You also need to be careful not to bend it. The other cable you might have is this one, which to be honest, I'm not gonna be using this build, but it's generally used for things like water cooling pumps. So if you're doing a full liquid loop system, then this may be the connection that you need. And that plugs in with the peripheral connection in the bottom left. And so that, for example, you can see is used with this Corsair pump. So this is a pump reservoir combo, and that has that power connection there. That's quite a rare connection, and you won't see me using it in this build because we don't really need it, but you can see the majority of those cables all set up and ready to go. So make sure you plug in everything that you need to before we go about the next part. This is important because it'll make your life a lot easier if you don't have to sort of look inside the case and try and work out where the cable is going to be plugged in. Now this is a 1200 watt PSU, which means it's pretty big. And with all the cables plugged in, it's going to be even larger. But what I was quite pleased with was it actually is quite obvious that it's still going to be easy to fit this PSU in here even with the hard drive trays mounted in there as well. So just do a little test fit. Make sure the fan faces down towards the bottom because it's gonna suck cold air in from below the case. But you can see that you can run the cables in here and sort of over the top of the hard disk drive cages and then seat that down. And it screws into the back and there's a removable plate for that, but there's a lot, plenty of space. There is plenty of space. I think you will be better off if you can remove those trays if you're not gonna use them though. So if they're not being used, take them out. So this rear tray is removable for the PSU if you need to. I actually didn't need to, you could see you could slide it in, but if you do need to for any reason, larger PSU or whatever, 
or if it's just for ease of use, you can just take this out. You need to line up the four holes with the back of the power supply unit and then use the included screws, which you'll see have this sort of flat head to them. You should get them with your PSU. They also come with a case. You have an option of which to use. These are obviously nice silver ones, but you can get black ones usually with the power supply unit. So just make sure that's seated down and secured nicely and ready to go. And then we just slip it back into the case. So from a different angle, you can see once again, just all the cables being connected up here. Now in fairness, maybe if I had loads more SSDs in there, I might have some more SATA connections and perhaps I might need a bit more room, but you can see actually is a good amount of space in here and there's a good amount of venting where it's going to be pulling the air in as well. So there's plenty of room and quite pleasing. You just slip that in and then secure those thumb screws to the rear and then the power supply is ready to go. Now, the other thing that you'll notice is there's plenty of different places to run cables. So on the right hand side of this case is also cable tidying loops and the Velcro ties as well. So the first thing I'm going to do is run the eight pin power supply cables for the CPU part of the motherboard up the top right here. There are plastic tie loops at the bottom right, which you could secure that with, but I'm not going to do that at this point. I'd recommend leaving any of that until the end so you make sure everything's secured properly and ready to go. But basically you're just gonna run these up here and tidy them up as much as possible. It is really important that you do make sure that things are neat and flattened down because you will find that the door on this case won't close properly otherwise. And I'll show you that later on because that I think is one of the biggest flaws or problems with this case. It's not quite enough room at the back, especially if you're a messy person in terms of the cables, which I definitely am. So it's worth bearing that in mind. So then obviously SSDs and fan controllers and the hard disk drives. So we've got that SATA connection I showed you earlier on. Now you just plug it in here to this bottom of this SSD as it's locked into its bay. And then we could run the other one to the hard disk drive bay on the bottom left there and make sure that's connected up. And also to run that 24 pin power supply cable up there as well. So we're gonna secure that with the cable ties and ready everything else that we can at this point. Next stage is to set up the H170 ILE Catholic. So I've done a video separately on this that will go into a lot more depth on the setup of it in terms of mounting the fans and things to think about with the pump head. So I'll link to that in the description if you want to find out more because it works with both Intel and AMD setups. I'm doing an AMD build in this instance. But other things to bear in mind. So 420 mil radiator in this case has to be mounted with the tubes to the rear. You can't put the radiator on the front of the case. It has to go on the top. The tubes have to be put at the rear. You also have to remove the rear fan from the case, as I said already. And then we want to go about the process of installing the fans on here. I'm installing them face down into the case to make sure it pulls air out from the case over the radiator to cool the rad down and keep it running cool. You need to make sure you push those cables towards the back and then we use the long screws that are included with the cooler into the fans and then into the radiator. Another point of note here is you also have some small screws and washers included with the all-in-one cooler, which are generally used for securing the radiator to your case. But actually what you need to do is watch out because in this case, you need to use some silver screws that are included with the case itself to mount the radiator instead. And that's because of the logic and design of the case and the way it's intended to work with larger radiators. And I'll show you, but basically there's different holes set up in there. Now with this all-in-one cooler, it has the commander core, which is a fan speed and RGB controller for these fans. So you can connect up the three fans, th three RGB connections on one side, three fan connections on the other. And that basically gives the IQ software, so of course there's IQ software control over both, and you can set it up and customize it within the software. Then we have the ROG Strix X670, and this is an AMD setup with the AMD 7700X CPU, and I'll show you the process for this, but basically it has a backplate already pre-installed on the motherboard, so you don't need to worry about that. This is an AM5 setup, so this cooler will work with AM5, and it has the necessary mounting plates for doing so. Another quick point that I'll get to in a second, but you also need low profile RAM for this if you're using a 420 mil cooler. It's noted by Leon Lee about the case in the specs. So you do need to keep that in mind that you might have problems if you've got big fat 
RAM as well. Now I know this is very specific, not everyone's going to be using a 420 mil cooler, but I wanted to show you the sort of points of this. So you take off the pre-installed brackets that come on the motherboard, and then you basically install the AM5 standoff screws. Make sure you use the fat ends into the motherboard, then the thin ends go on the top. We're then using the Ryzen 7 7700X processor. And I've done a video separately on the setup of this and how to install these if you've not seen it already, but it's basically very much like Intel. So there's a little gold arrow on it now, which points in the right direction. You need to line that up with that on the motherboard. So the process for this is actually really straightforward, but the pins are on the motherboard itself. So you have to put the CPU in really carefully. So you lift the little latch here and then lift that back and then remove the cover and then you can see you can access the pins on here. But if you're not careful, if you drop the CPU and you could damage the pins potentially. So really carefully and gently lower this in and line up that gold arrow with the gold arrow on the motherboard on the corners. Then reseat the cap and then push that lever down. And this will flick that little protective cap off. I'd recommend keeping that in case you ever need to do anything with the motherboard in future, whether you're selling it or giving it to someone else after removing your CPU. But if you damage those pins, that could potentially be a problem. You can see we've now got a lot of the setup ready before we even go about installing in the case. But now I'm going to show you the setup process for the NVMe drives on this one. So I'm actually going to use three NVMe SSDs on this. You can potentially install four on this motherboard, which is pretty nuts. I'm going to do a video separately on the motherboard. But it'll obviously work with PCIe Gen 4 SSDs, which is what I'm going to be using here. And I've got an WD Black SN850, a Kingston KC3000, and a Corsair MP600. And basically, we remove these heatsink shields down the bottom. One of the neat things about this one is it's actually a fatter shield for the very bottom to keep things running a little bit cooler. Underneath, you'll find those little plastic covers protecting the thermal pads between the motherboard and the NVMe drive. You basically just push these NVMe SSDs in, slip them in, and then use the little Q-latch plastic clip to hold them in place. Really nice, because it means there's no screws here. Now, these drives are really fast. I'd highly recommend considering installing one. I like to have one for my boot, drive one for my videos that i'm editing and one for games separates things out but it also ensures that windows boots really quickly your games load really quickly and you can transfer files around really fast as well you remove the other plastic sticker from the other thermal pad on the heat shield and then put it back in place i've done videos separately on the setup process for these drives if you need it there are some quirks in the bios and in windows in order to get them setting up and running sometimes. And actually it might be easier just to install one drive, install Windows on it, and then install the other drives afterwards to make sure you know which drive Windows is installed on. But I know what I'm doing here. Windows is already installed on that WD Black SN850. But then you can see that you then have other mounting points for NVMEs down the bottom here. And same sort of logic, but you will notice that some of them plug in upside down. So you can just slip that in and then hold it in place with that Q latch. Now again, the bottom one of this is actually designed really intelligently on this motherboard. This actually has a fatter heat shield for the very bottom so that faster drives can be installed down here and then that'll provide better cooling. So you can see there's actually two. So I removed one and then you have this larger one with actually more shielding on it so it should dissipate heat more effectively and that also has thermal pads on it. Don't forget to remove those stickers. It's really important to do that beforehand. And then once you've done that, you can then seat it back down over the top. It is a little bit fiddly and it is definitely fat, which is something to bear in mind. It certainly doesn't cause any problems in this case. Now for the RAM installation, I'm using Crucial RAM here and I'll leave the specs in the description. But this is low profile RAM and it's actually quite fast DDR5 RAM that works here, but we need to install it in slots A2 and B2. So the second one in and then the fourth one across. You've got to make sure you use those two slots if you're only using two sticks of RAM to make sure it runs at the right speed and is recognized properly by your BIOS and by Windows. Push it down and push them all the way in until they clip nicely into place. We now have most of the stuff ready to go. So the setup now is to basically make sure that the pump is ready as well. So this comes pre-installed with an Intel bracket. 
This is going to vary from all-in-one cooler to all-in-one cooler, obviously, depending on what you're doing. But for the most part, I do find that they default to Intel, especially with Corsair. So you then have to swap out the bracket that holds the pump head in place with the AMD ones. So you can see you've got straight clips here for AM5 that basically just push into place on the pump head. You will notice there's pre-applied thermal paste on this, so you don't need to worry about any thermal paste on there but I would recommend putting the protective cap back on to make sure you don't damage the thermal paste when you go through the rest of the installation process or while you're waiting to go about the rest of the installation process. One of the things that you can do is you can use scissors to just trim this off because you'll notice obviously now we've got a different shape to the pump head. You can actually not put this back on as standard because it won't go over those brackets. But you can just clip it down shorten the, the sides and then it will push back on there quite easily so that's then protected for the future now i want to show you one of the mistakes i made so don't follow this just yet one of the things that i wanted to demonstrate is the installation logic here and what you need to do and what you need to think about so you can see the 420 mil cooler obviously goes into the top as i said earlier on you need to make sure the tubes are to the left you also need to make sure you remove the rear fan before you go about this process because you can see there's not very much space there for forcing this radiator in and also the tubes would be in the way of that fan as well so that's something to keep in mind you also need to line up the radiator with the holes on top you'll notice there's some really tiny holes at the very edge of the case right near the front and some other ones at the back of it as well there are a lot of different holes here obviously you've got set up for different size radiators whether you're using a 360 mil or you're just using fans on the top or you're using a custom loop system so there's different sort of logic to it but you have six screws that are included with the case that you need to use specifically so these are thin long silver screws and they screw into place once those are screwed in, I was then running the cables through to the rear so they're all out of the way and ready to set up later on with the commander core that I showed you earlier. And basically just various different points to push those through into. I thought foolishly that this was the most logical way to do it and that it would be easier to do it this way and then to install the motherboard. And this is the important point that I don't want you to follow. And I like to make these mistakes while I'm doing the build so that you don't make them too. So basically you can see that I can put the motherboard in here quite easily. There's enough space to put it back in, install it so it's ready to go and see it down. And you could theoretically even screw it in. But what I realized then was because of where it's positioned and how much space there is between the radiator and the motherboard, which isn't very much to be honest, and I then can't connect up the power cables from the power supply unit to the top of the motherboard. And this is a problem because it's basically the rad is in the way. So now I need to take the radiator out. So I just basically need to unscrew those screws that I put in and take the rad out. So basically what I'm saying is install your motherboard first and then your radiator. Plug in the two 8-pin CPU power connectors at the top left here and maybe consider plugging in the all-in-one pump head connection from your all-in-one pump or any CPU fan connectors that you have because they're in the top right. You might want to plug those in before you put the radiator in because you're not going to have much space in there. Now, I can't speak to what happens if you've got a 360mm radiator, but I'd imagine it'll be a similar problem, similar consideration. So just think about that beforehand as well. You can see now that it's also still really tight, so you need to be really careful when putting this radiator in there as well. And again, the reason you need low profile RAM is because otherwise the radiator won't be able to be just pushed in there because it's just going to be too tight. So just keep that in mind that you might have this issue. I've actually seen tighter fits in other cases though. So I was actually surprised by how much room there is considering the sheer size of this radiator and how it fits. But again, once it's in, you've got to slip it back in, make sure you use those silver screws that are included in the case and then screw it into place. Then we need to seat the pump head down on top of the CPU and screw the four thumb screws that are included with it. Another quick note is you'll see that the thermal paste has actually been transferred on the CPU already. That's because I discovered the standoff screws are installed the wrong way around. Standoffs for AM5 are fatter on the bottom that connects up to the motherboard than they are on the top. So make sure you install them the right way around. Don't make the same mistake as me, otherwise you won't be able to tighten up these thumb screws so just watch out for that because that's an easy mistake to make <laughs> and it was a real pain because I had to remove the entire thing but once it's secured 
You then have two cables to connect up, one for the all-in-one pump header on the motherboard, which I found was still accessible. If a little bit fiddly, you can see it's a little bit fiddly to get in, but it does plug in there. And then the other cable runs through to the back of the case and connects up to the commander core. That was fairly easy because you just feed it through to the back and then connect it up in a second. And then you can see, so basically this is nearly the finished build. We've got the radiator mounted, the motherboard obviously, and you can see just how much space there is on the right hand side. So plenty of space for a liquid loop system. Now I'm running the other cables here. So I'm gonna run this fat 24 pin power supply cable through to the front. Now you can see what I was talking about with the adjustable cable tray. So you can see obviously we can reposition it now so that we can then run that cable through the rubber bits and push it in to make sure it's connected up and you have options as to where to do it. And it does hide the cables away nicely from the front, visible, but you can adjust it into the position that works for you. So if you had an EATX motherboard, you might have moved it further over, but you might find it, maybe you've moved it a little bit close as I have done here, so I can move it back a little bit, and then I can get that cable in in a nicer way, because some of these 24 pin power cables are a bit fat and really difficult to manipulate into the right position to then connect up and push down into place. And obviously you have to make sure that's seated properly. Otherwise your PC won't turn on even if you followed all the right steps. The next one is for the front panel. So the top panel USB connections. So this is for USB-C and USB-A connections on the top of the case at the front. So we run these through again in the same sort of gap, but just below the 24 pin connector and they run through to the front and then they connect up on the right hand side of the motherboard. So there's a lot of different cables included with the case. You can see here a mess of cables and a lot of things to think about potentially. It might look a bit scary, but actually I'm gonna break them down for you. So this is a black USB 3.0, which is USB-A. And then on the right hand side is the USB-C connection. One of the cables, the one on the left, can only go in one way. And you'll see there's a little notch on it to let you know sort of which way around it is. And the USB-C one, as you might expect, goes in either way. <laughs> So here's a closer look at it again outside the case, just so you can see the logic of it. And this cable is blue, ignore that fact, but it will plug in on the bottom there, just below the 24 pin. They're usually the same place, no matter what motherboard you're using. And then the USB-C plugs in just above that and that will go in either way, but the fatter USB-A one only goes in one direction. So don't force it, be very careful with it. Next one is HD audio. This is the 3.5 mil connection on the top of the case where you plug in your headphone jack. This plugs in and the bottom left. Now it's sometimes marked AAFP or HD audio. You can only plug this in one way because there's basically one pin missing. So it's pretty easy to line up that cable and connect it up. Then you have the power switch. So this is obviously the power button on the front of the case and the reset button. This cable will often run to the bottom right hand side. And again, you can see that one pin is missing from that. So there's one hole that isn't available and you can basically just line that up with that there and you can see power switch markings on there. But if you have trouble, just refer to your motherboard manual because it will tell you where to connect it up. But usually it's in the bottom right hand side. Then for the RGB connections for the fans, you'll see that the final connector on that looks like this, which is a five volt RGB connector. But it also comes out of this connector here, which you can pull out and disconnect if you want to. And that sort of logically works with Lee and Lee's products. So if you have Lee and Lee fan controller, for example, you might be able to connect that up there, but you can also just connect it up directly to your motherboard. Then that then gives you RGB control from your motherboard. You usually find there's a five volt RGB header on the motherboard. This is one on the bottom left here. You can see five volt. There's two of them actually with three connectors on there. This is also daisy chainable, this cable. You'll see you can pull off these caps and other parts of it and it'll have other connectors on it too so if you're using other lean Lee things other rgb things you could potentially connect those up as well now the power bit of this is split into three connectors so you can see three power cables coming from the front rgb fans they then connect up to that three splitter basically takes three connections and puts it into one so you then have one single connection so this makes life a lot easier because it uses less fan headers on your motherboard. But you're basically looking to connect these up to a system fan header or chassis fan header on your motherboard. So CHA. And there are a number of these usually scattered around the motherboard. And you'll find them again in your manual. But it's usually in the top right, bottom right. 
you can see some here in the bottom right by the battery, for example, chassis fan three, chassis fan four, it might be sys fan as another option. So those are all the different connections. I'm going to show you them again now and mounted into the case. The USB-A plugs into the right hand side here and then USB-C right above it. But you can see how that's run through the rubber bits. So basically most of the cable is hidden away there. Looks kind of neat. That obviously keeps things out of sight. Now this is the data cable for your SSDs and hard disk drives. There's four points for this on this motherboard. You might find more on different ones, but they're basically plugs in usually somewhere in the middle. And then you'd run that back to the back and connect it up to your SSDs or hard disk drives. And then that allows for data transfer between those and the motherboard. So you can see that other side of it here just runs up and connects in there. These are included with the motherboard usually. So you usually find multiples of these included with your motherboard and you connect those up to the various drives. And then you'd have access to those once you log into Windows. And then you can see me connecting up the RGB header to the bottom of the motherboard there. And then the various other cables that I've already shown you, including that front panel power button, which is obviously very important. Next stage is to connect up the fan controller for the Corsair H170i Elite Capolix cooler. You've got to work out the position for this. So this is the commander core. Now, important to basically work out where it can be positioned in the case where it will have enough length because I need to connect up the pump head to it. I need to connect up the controller itself to the motherboard via USB and SATA power, so the same as the SSD. And I also need the fans from the radiator to reach it. There are multiple mounting points on this case. You'll seen that one that I removed earlier on in the video. There's also three here potentially where you could position it. This comes with 3M stickers so you can just stick it down into place, but it's important to make sure it has enough length where you can run the cables to the right place. So USB connection, for example, and then we need to make sure that flat connector from the pump head comes in and plugs into it here. And then you'd run the three cables in for the RGB and the three in for the power as well. So that's fully connected up and then ready to be controlled. Make sure you've got the SATA power and USB connections. That's really important too. So that the IQ can recognize that and the pump head. So that'll give you control over both the pump and the fans from Corsair's IQ software once you get into Windows. If you want to find out more about this, again, I'll link to the full video in the description where I went into a lot more depth on all the different things. But that is the basic setup for it and to just make sure that it's powered as necessary. If you're adding more Corsair fans in, obviously you can plug those into this controller as well. And when I revisit this case, I'm going to be using Lee and Lee fans throughout. So if you're interested in that and want to see more Lee and Lee RGB instead of Corsair, then stick with me because I'm going to swap out those Corsair fans for Lee and Lee ones. So once you've got this set up, you may need to connect up USB connections. So for example, for your pump and for other things, you can see those connect up in the middle and this motherboard has three connectors. So now I've finished that for the most part. There are still some more steps, but you can see we just do a test. So just plug it in and test to make sure everything's spinning up as it should be. So those front fans, the pump lights up. The fans obviously lighting up as well. And now I'm using a 3060 Super for demo purposes, which then obviously connects up to the top PCIe X16 slot. This gives you the maximum speed out of this graphics card via your motherboard. Make sure it runs at the maximum speed and gets the best performance out of it. And then re-secure it with the screws that are included to make sure it's in place. Now this only requires one 8-pin power connection, so it's pretty easy to have that cable running from the rear through that cable hiding tray, mostly hidden away out of sight and quite neat. You could potentially run it from the bottom instead where the USB connections are, for example. And then we obviously just need to put everything back together and slide all those trays back on and then push them into place and make sure everything's done as it should be. And obviously that bottom SSD tray. Now, the other thing here is obviously I've not done any cable tidying apart from using the Velcro ties. I probably could have used some plastic ties and this is where I come unstuck. So I wanted to note this because it's important. You'll need to make sure that you have secured your cables down as much as you possibly can at this point, because you will find probably that you'll have this same issue that I did. You can see that this door on the left hand side isn't closing properly. And this presents a bigger issue once you put the glass panel back on. So I want to demonstrate this because it's an important point of the build process, I think. There's not much room back here. And yes, you have the ability to close that door. Now, you could put the glass panel back on and then close the door 
and it will close. And I think if it's standing up and you're not moving the case around very much, it'll be fine. But well, the problem I had, and you can see I haven't actually got a hell of a lot of cables in here. But the problem I've got is that I can close this door, but yet it will still pop back open because the inner door isn't fully shut. Now, a quick note, you will notice that there are some clips in the bottom left here that are used for transport purposes. There's actually a note about removing them before finishing your build because it's actually just used for shipping. I'm actually leaving mine on for the minute just because of the adjustment I'm going to be doing to it, but you would take those off normally. But you can see that the door will just fall open because it's not properly tight at the back there. There's too much going on at the rear of the case. My cable management's terrible. It's just not sitting as nicely as it should, so it's basically popping that door open, unfortunately. So I need to work out a way to tidy this up. You can see you've got to push it back into place, but it just pops up a little bit at the top here, the top left. I tried tidying up a little bit and then re-securing it, but I still found that it fell open again with very little convincing. You're meant to pull on that little flap at the front that you can see on the front panel to loosen that connection to open it, but I just found it wasn't closing properly and wasn't clipping back in. So I think this is important. Yes, it's my incompetence at this point, but it's worth keeping in mind. Now, one solution might be just to not put that door back on, not put the inner door on, and just leave the cables exposed and then close the glass panel. But then obviously everyone can see your cable shame. So I think it's a bit of a shame that you can't easily hide these cables away. But I guess that's the point of this case is to have ability to show off your internals. I don't get that personally. It's one thing I don't like about this design actually. But that's probably because I'm useless at cable management. I think I'd just tighten these up, use some plastic cable ties instead, just hook them up a bit nicer and you won't have an issue. On the front, obviously, on the other side, no problems. The door goes on again and slides back into place and then it's secured and that's not just going to come open. Now you probably won't find that your door is just coming open anyway, but obviously I'm going to be moving this case around a fair bit. I'm also going to be real building in it and what I don't want to do is that door to swing open and smash because that would be less than ideal. But here you can see the finished product and how it looks. I'm pretty happy with it. Obviously, there are some foibles to this setup. The RGB fans on the front, for example, don't match the ones on the inside. They're from different brands, so that presents some issues in terms of the RGB lighting potentially. But you could swap out the Corsair fans for Lee and Lee, or you could swap out the Lee and Lee fans for Corsair, depending on what you want to do. But I'm pretty happy with this case. I, I do like it. I really like the flexibility of what you can do with it. It has lots of different customization options, insane amounts of storage options, plenty of space at the bottom for your power supply unit or other things. It's limited, I think, on the on the rear for the cable management. I don't like having the glass door at the back, but obviously if you're buying this case, then you knew what you were getting into in the first place. Also, it is one of the nicer ones to set up and it is a pretty good build really so as i said earlier on i'm going to be revisiting this case in the very near future with lee and lee fans throughout so let me know if you like what you like to see in there and if you enjoyed this build and also stick around for the full review or i'll sort of talk about the both setups um which i preferred but it's really nice to have a pretty understated case with a massive cooler in it i think if you have a high-end CPU and you want to get maximum cooling out of it. Obviously, having a 420 mil radiator in there is pretty good. I actually found, despite the warnings about low-profile RAM and obviously some of the quirks with installation, that it was surprisingly easy to fit this in here and it's still roomy enough. Press the button at the front to change the RGB lighting. This has been the Provoke Pro and thanks for sticking with me all the way to the end of the video. If you made it here, hopefully you found it useful. Let me know in the comments what you thought. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that thumbs up button because all these things really help me out and I appreciate you. Thanks for watching. You've made it right to the end of the video, you brilliant legend you. If you've enjoyed it, click that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up and drop me a comment down below if you've got any questions. If you really enjoyed it, consider joining the channel and see the benefits of doing so. Check out these other videos. You might well find them interesting or useful. And most importantly, have a great life.